In today's latest episode, we are talking to Julissa Cruz, owner and founder of Latin Vintage Dance Company. Check it out. Marker. Welcome, Julissa. How are you? Good morning. Good. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming on uh, to Cafe Con Jen. Uh, I'm starting off with a black coffee. What are you starting off? Cafe con leche. Hey. <laughs> uh, this is a thank you for coming on. And I just wanted to kind of start. I don't know if you've seen on the news uh, during this quarantine where people put up signs outside of their window mm-hmm. uh, of something that they may need and don't want to go outside for. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. Yeah. So there was an elderly lady who put up like a sign of like need more beer. And the community was like, this older lady obviously needs more beer. Uh, so my question for you is, what would your sign read if you mm-hmm. were to put it outside? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm trying to think what I would need. Um, I don't know that it would be something physical, like an actual object of some sort. There's not a physical need for anything. I guess if I had to, um, it would probably be... Uh, I had to pick something physical. It would probably be need more bread. <laughs> <laughs> if we go through bread, like it's insane. You know, my kids love bread or need more fruit because uh, fruit is uh, few and far between nowadays and it's like super expensive. But, but that's probably it. That, other than that, uh, physical needs, and there's nothing really that is a need. I mean, there's wants, obviously, but need? No. Plus, we're at the gross. We have so many people in this house that we're like constantly at the grocery store. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that would awesome. be it. No, that's a, is it, is it a specific type of bread or just like regular white all, square bread? All kinds of all, bread. You we don't have killer Dave's bread. We have regular honey wheat. We have the French bread, especially the ones that like those baguettes that you hear them crunch. Yeah. The good ones. Um, the rolls, we have like seven types of bread. <laughs> that you use for so many different things hot dogs hamburgers we eat a lot of bread which is probably not the best thing but it's the one thing we can't give up yet <laughs> when you it comes just, to grain you just gotta you gotta live your life you gotta have a balance of like the good and the bad yeah for sure uh, so i kind of i so transitioning into that um can you uh, would you give the audience a background of like what was your first experience in dance like what what inspired what inspired you to pursue it to the longevity of where you're a business owner in dance? Oof. My first, um, I guess, uh, formal experience in dance was when I, when we took a classes, um, classes when I was like 10, I signed up for a studio. My mom signed me up for a studio. That's probably the first formal experience I've had in dance. Um, but I don't know. I think, I think just watching things, like watching um, Broadway shows or music videos and stuff like that instilled that or just being around the house, we always had music playing. So I think I always just had found a joy in it um, that I didn't find in just regular going outside or doing things like that. So just having music uh, brought me joy. Um, And I think that just inspired me to want to get into dance in general. Um, So when I got into dance, I was 10. And I started off with jazz and, um, and we did like competitions. I, I was part of a studio competition, a competitive studio. Um, and it was just one of those things that you had to work hard for. And there was always like this end result, right? Like, oh, I worked hard for a, for a certain period of time. And then I did this competition and then we got this award. And it was like, it felt, it felt simple like math right? Like I used to want to major in math because I was like, there's always an answer, you know, two plus two is always going to be four, you know, like, I don't want like these, these shades of gray. I just want it to be like this. So with dance, I always felt if you work hard, you're going to be good. Like if, if I work on this double turn, I'm going to get this double turn by the end of the year. Or if I work on this, I'm going to get this. It didn't become um, free movement until I got older in dance. And I was like, oh, it's super interpretive. It's nothing like math, (laughs) but, but, um, So yeah, so I went through studio classes and then I didn't get like, I wasn't introduced to formal salsa training, so to speak, until I was about 
19, 18, when, you know, when you were allowed to go to the club <laughs> as a person in Florida. So that's when I started to see, oh, people like put their arm up on a certain count or like they turn on a certain count. Like I, I didn't really think of it that way because when you grow up doing it in your house, you're just in la cocina, like you're not counting, you're not thinking about anything. So then I realized, oh, okay, this is like math. <laughs> like this has a purpose. Like you have to prep on this thing. You have to put your arm out. So then I went into that and I, I was fascinated with um, the fact that it, it was so relatable to all the other training I've had, like jazz and ballet. Oh, it has a count. It has a, it has a technique. It has this. So I'd like that portion of it. But then like the rest of it, as, as much as I learned, then I was like, oh, wait, it's also interpretive. So there's like this, like this balance, right? Um, of back and forth between it. And I think I just, as I grew in salsa and Latin form and, and with my partner, when I got my partner, the more interpretive I became, the more connected to, to the other dance forms. So it just started to blur the lines. And I really enjoyed that. And I enjoyed seeing when others would watch, like when others would watch performances or things like that, I felt like people found the joy. Like I was able to give the joy that I was now receiving. So I think, um, and I had been teaching like other forms. So when I started teaching, when I moved to Virginia, I wanted to, to become a teacher of that and, and now bring that joy to other adults, right? Because not that, I mean, kids do it, but where we were, it was more of an adult dance form, a social dance form for doing salsa, bachata, all these, all these other things were more for adults. So I was now a young adult and I wanted to, to get my experience in, in teaching other adults to bring that joy, to bring that balance between the technique and the, the interpretive into now movement that you can enjoy through your adulthood. So I think that's why I always thought that I was going to own a dance studio because I loved being in a dance studio all my life. I never thought that it would be like a Latin dance studio. I always thought it was just going to be like a regular, you know, like kids three and up, you know, like jazz, ballet, tap, you know, because that's what I did all my life. Like I just saw myself always doing that because I loved being part of it. So it was interesting when I grew as an adult and I was like, oh, I can, I can do this salsa. And to this day, I'm still like, I can't believe I just went <laughs> like all, all Latin, like it's still interesting. But as I grew older, I was like, Latin is still interpretive. Like you can, it's still a form of movement. Like sometimes I, I used to always feel I, I can only do one, two, three, five, six, seven, one, two, three, five, six, seven. Until I started teaching other adults and realizing that they needed this, you know, this, this movement in between those counts. And, um, and it just inspired me to keep going and, and start this business and try to teach other people why I loved it so much and why it had this balance between um, counts and non-counts and just expression. So um, I started Latin Vintage because I, one, I had really nothing else to do when I moved to Virginia. You know, I knew absolutely no one, you know. It was just, I was just, uh, we were, I was a newlywed. So I was like, okay, um, I can't be home all day long <laughs> with, my, <laughs> with my new spouse. <laughs> like... I need something to do. I need to move. I need to dance. I need to like find my voice as a young adult, as a young wife, as a, you know, like, and my husband didn't dance at the time. So then it was like, okay, well, kill two birds with one stone. Let's put them together. Now I need you to learn how to dance for me. <laughs> so it was a lot of, uh, starting Latin Vintage was a lot of different, um, different crossroads in my adulthood. So like the, the business portion was a crossroad, uh, interpreting that with who I was as an adult, like as a young adult, I was like 25 at the time. So, you know, 25 year olds absolutely don't know anything about life yet. <laughs> so it was yes, a lot I, of, I can attest to that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> 25 is like, now I'm 36 and I'm like, Whoa, what was I thinking? Ten years ago? <laughs> so I think it was just a learning experience. And I think that, um, that I just wanted to do it because I always, um, feel like feel the need to grow personally so I think all these experiences make me grow as a as a person as a wife they're all interrelated so I think I just went that route when I went to open up a business I felt like it was a um 
a grown person thing to do. And I wanted it to be official. You know, I didn't want it to be like this thing I just do on the side. Like I wanted it to hold weight uh, and to hold value for me. And so that when people saw it, they knew it was valuable to me and it, it held weight for them at that point. Yeah. So I, I always felt like the business route and opening Latin Vintage was the way I could, I could share that value and, and prove that value that I had for it to a certain extent. No, that that's amazing. Um, hearing you speak, it's uh, I didn't I didn't really recognize that you that you opened up your studio before you became a mom. Yes. So now I'm just curious how you have an, a business. Well, actually, before that, before we touch into how that transition into balancing the, all aspects of your life, um, how did you get started in opening the business? I, I feel like as a as a Latin dancer. Uh, and being in a circle with other of my with my peers, sometimes it's really hard to understand. Okay, I'm a professional dancer. I travel across uh, many congresses. I'm getting all this income, sometimes cash, sometimes check. Not really knowing how to kind of validate it, kind of like solidify, professionalize it. Yes. What kind of mentorship or what kind of resources do you have when you open up your business to help you incorporate and that like really professionalize your business? So um, I had a few friends that were, that I used to be like, you're the smartest friends I have. So I'm going to ask you all my questions. (laughs) I had a, I had a friend who was in Florida. Uh, His name is Emilio Emilio. And he had done, we had done a, um, a project together. He had written a play and it was about salsa and um, it was a fictional play. Like it wasn't about the history of salsa or anything like that. It was just, you know, a play people go to see. It was about a, a, a kid who was growing up and wanted to be a professional salsa dancer. And I had worked with him on different projects. Like he did a, a, a reality show um, when I was with Salsa Heat called Making the Team. So I had diff- different projects. So I always was like, if I have any like real doll questions, I'm gonna call him. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got to Virginia, I called him and I was like, listen, I think I want to like make this official, you know, like I, I want to go the official route and have like this studio. I mean, I don't have money like that, you know, because I'm like a newlywed. We had just moved to Richmond. It was my husband's um, first facility. Uh, he's an air traffic controller. So we basically didn't choose where we were going. We were just going to Richmond. Um, so I was like, I want to have something that I can create that'll be mine and that'll be, you know, for the years to come. So he was like, yeah, you know, you should do this. Like, what do you, what do you want as your future? You know, like he sent me a bunch of websites about businesses as far as to know if I wanted to do like an LLC, like different things like that. Right. And what I needed to do if I was going to be a single and, en- you know, like a single entity, like we talked about name, the importance of the name and, and things like that. So the official name of the business is Latin Vintage Productions because I always visualize in the future that there would be other things underneath it and that would be like the umbrella name, right? So the Latin Vintage Productions was the umbrella name of other things that I could put underneath it. Like my event that came later was Pura Vintage. It came under underneath it. My husband has a photography uh, a company that he put it, that he put together. It's underneath it. It's Instant Vintage. So all these different things built on this idea this main idea so he helped me really um figure that out like figure out where i wanted to be longevity with this like which also made me feel okay i have to commit to this this isn't like this this whim that i'm just gonna be like i'm gonna just put a dance company together and it's gonna be great and that's it and then two years later it's nothing you know so i had to really think okay if i'm thinking this far ahead in in the future then i really have to commit to all the steps i have to commit to the hard work of it and so I started off with just getting, um, you know, my, my corporation, my LLC. And, you know, I just asked, I'm a, I asked a lot of questions. I'm just like, okay, what do I need to do next? So I was always at the, like the city court or whatever in Richmond, trying to file paperwork, trying to get my EIN. And then I would look for a space. Cause I'm like, I'm not, I can't afford, again, I'm poor <laughs> at that point, you know, I'm 25. So I'm like, I need, um, I need to find a space to rent. Okay, where do I want a space? Do I want a dance studio? Most dance studios don't rent out to other businesses unless you are coming in, coming under their umbrella, you know? Yeah. And I wanted to be self, you know, like by myself. So I found a space. It was literally like a warehouse. It had like concrete, not even smooth floors. It wasn't like the best, but it was um, like a mom and pop 
space and they had like art like an art gallery on top and it was like a family of musicians it was like a mom and dad of musician and all their kids played a gazillion instruments so there was always instruments in the space and it was like it felt like it felt vintagey and different and like okay this could be something great so I started there and I was there for like three years and you'd be amazed because I, I would always thought I don't know if this floor is going to work for dance shoes <laughs> and it's like <laughs> but people didn't care they would jack up a <laughs> pair of shoes and it was straight up on concrete, you know, like when nothing, when no one was teaching classes like that in Richmond to, to that extent, you know, and, and I would call my, my first part, my, my partners in Salsa Heat that I used to have, like some of my male team members. Um, and I would be like, okay, so I want to start a syllabus. Like I want to make it official. So I'm going to have this and this and this on level one. And this is what I want to have on level two. Does that make sense? And at that point I hadn't really taught a lot of leading I did a lot of following and so I hadn't really taught. So it was a teaching experience for me too, because I don't have anyone physically here. So I would be on the phone and they would be like, okay, so your left foot steps forward on the one. And then as you pivot, like they're breaking it down and I'm like, all right, so what do I do with my hand? You know, like I'm learning through, we didn't have zoom back then, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, I'm trying to visualize everything. And so I had to create this syllabus and, you know, I had to think of a logo and, and it, it's a lot of different steps, you know, that you, at the beginning, you don't have to start with any of those steps. You just need to start with your LLC and just find a space and start and start um, promoting yourself and going out and talking to people and letting them know what your, your vision is, you know, selling your vision and your motivation to other people so they can be like, oh, that's pretty cool. Let me come and see your class. Um, so in the beginning, it wasn't much, but there was always like this timeline or this, this list of things that I wanted to make sure I got, like, we didn't have t-shirts in the beginning. I just bought everyone like red polos. Like I went to, like, I don't know, <laughs> old Navy, old, yeah, everybody, old had Navy. These, everybody had the same red polos, you know? And then, uh, when we got our logo, I was asking people, okay, does anyone know how to make t-shirts? I didn't go to like a t-shirt company. I went to like this barber who like made t-shirts in his backyard. And when I went over there, they were printed on like these highlighter orange things. And I was like, oh my God, they're so bright. This is so <laughs> bright. It's not gonna look good on every kit. But I was like, we're gonna roll with it. So we were like, these are caution orange. So everyone we went, we were like, <laughs> everyone knew they were like, oh, those are those orange people from Richmond. <laughs> So it was like a learning process, you know, and then you go through like rebranding and reorganizing your syllabus and your structure, because once people get through, through the whole thing, you're like, okay, that maybe that was too easy. We got it. So it's a, it's a long experience, but I would say that the, the very beginnings are super simple. You know what I mean? Like, I think people think I want to open a business, but there's so many, uh, so many things on the checklist to do. And there really isn't, you know, especially if it's just you by yourself, you know, like unless you're trying to hire employees, which obviously you can always go into that later as you start. But I would suggest anyone to just start, you know, just open up your LLC and have it and just, and just start simple. You know, it, it doesn't take a lot. Again, I didn't have a lot. I actually started working at Red Lobster because I was like, I need some money to pay for this rent. for my classes. Wow. So I started working at Red Lobster and, uh, which I had never been a waitress of any kind, but I'm the type of person that I'll get any job as long as it pays me money. I'm like, uh, I need to work. Okay, let's go. Let's see who's hiring. You know, it's not. So I worked at Red Lobster to try and pay for my hobby of dance at that point, you know, for my dream. So I've had a lot of odd end jobs just to support the business because it was my firstborn, you know, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, I, that was like three years before I even, three years? Let me see. I started in 09. The business was 09. So yeah, three years, three years before I even had a child. So it was just my, me, my husband and our firstborn Latin vintage. <laughs> <laughs> so you, and you, hearing you speak, uh, speaks volumes of how brave I think sometimes in my, in my network of peers, uh, this mentality of just starting of just doing it, um, is holds them back because they could have a plan. They have like, they already have their logo. They already have their name. They have all of these things, but it just never comes into fruition because of a fear. Um, and you speak with, I just feel like all the bravery and the confidence in your voice. And I guess my, my next question is, is how did you step into the uh, role of being a mom? 
Mm -hmm. uh, with that same confidence, with that same bravery, uh, knowing again, that's, it's a first time experience. Yeah. uh, And having a business. Yeah. um, So when I, when, again, it was probably like three years after um, when my first child was born, but um, it was one of those things because I had opened up Latin Vintage, I met a lot of people. So those students eventually became like my family, you know, like they were like everything to, to us at that time as a couple, because we had no actual family in Richmond. So Richmond became our home and those extended students and people that um, eventually would teach for us or, or, you know, dance for us or whatever, they became our family, you know, to this day, I like, I think we were in some, we, Orlando was the best man at a wedding. And, you know, we were in weddings. We were like godchildren to kids and vice versa. So it just became this like family. So when I got pregnant, I never, I never felt like it was going to be difficult to be a mom because I felt like everyone was going to be there. You know, like the whole studio was going to be there. At that point is actually when I started, um, right before I had, well, when I was pregnant, before I announced it to everyone, we had gotten our own space. So we were, we were building our own studio, so to speak. So we had put floors in, we had to put like, you know, wall bearing beams and painting. And so all this was happening um, at the same time. And I feel like just knowing that I had all these people there prepared me to not be scared to step into motherhood because I never felt like I was going to be utterly alone. Um, But when I had the baby the first time, (laughs) the first baby, it was hard to understand the difference between motherhood and entrepreneurship, right? Because as an entrepreneur, you're like, go, go, go. We need to do this. We need to do that. You're always constantly on the, on the growing end of things, right? You always want your company to grow. You're always thinking about what your next move is, setting budgets, whatever. So when the child came to play, it was like, you need to slow down. And I didn't, I, it didn't really hit me until maybe like six months after my child was born. Like, oh, you can't, you can't multitask like this. (laughs) Like the first two months I swore, you know, like I was back, I was back in the studio like two weeks after. Oh, wow. And just like, because I felt like, no, this is my child. This is my other child. I have to be here. You know, like I was on stage like two months after and I almost died. I was like, Oh my God, I'm so tired. (laughs) Like, what is this? My baby's two months old. And I like, I'll never forget that experience. Like I was on stage and the routine was like three minutes long of a solo. And the, I guess they had some technical issues that the song stopped. And girl, I was like, praise the Lord, because I don't want to do it again. They were like, do you want me to start it over? I was like, no, they got, they got whatever they were going to get. <laughs> like, they I got it. it. They, 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 un- they understand how I can good. dance. They got no, it. <laughs> I can't do no more. So then it's, that's when it hit me. I was like, oh, wait, I need like rest. But I would take my son to class all the time. He was like an infant. I would just be on the carrier or I would have him with one of those rap things. And he was like here. And I was teaching one, two, three, five, six, seven, or I would just hand them over to someone and they're like sitting on the chair. So it was a lot of shifting, you know, but I will say that um, one of the best advice I got when I became a mom, because you read all these books and you're talking, a lot of mothering books are like, you have to keep the child on a schedule. You have to do it because you want them to um, get used to structure, right? Even from a baby, you know, you feed them every two to three hours. You change them every time you feed them, you burp them, you know, like it's always like this thing, right? But one of the best advice I got is that you have to keep your children, especially when you're in that first year, you have to put them on your schedule. So like if you work nights, you can't just keep them on a schedule that's comfortable for every other child. You have to, this is your child. So now they have, they're part of your life. So a lot of times people become mothers and they change their every day in order to adjust to every other mother that they've known with every other kid except not everybody has the same schedule. So I would be at the studio till like 11 o'clock at night and my kid was there with me. So he was always, so he got used to my schedule, which was, which made the transition or the balance, I would say much easier because I wasn't having to like rush home because I had to feed him. No, I was always there with him. He was always with me, but now he was on my schedule. So now he became a night out with me and now we're sleeping in day like, which made it easier 
for being tired and trying to do everything. It just made it so much better, you know, like trying to, trying to keep it, keep myself sane in that, in that first year. And then, um, and I loved it. I loved being a mom. I was just like, oh my God, it's like, it's, it's like this came out of me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is insane. This person saw like my insides and it was just like, I loved every minute of it. I, as soon as the kid came out, it was just like, it was a completely different experience. It was just, the business still mattered, obviously, but then it was just like, okay, now I have something else. And now the business mattered almost more because now it's like, okay, now I have a child that one, I want them to grow up and see how hard I've worked and I want them to grow up and see this legacy, or I want them to grow up and continue this legacy for me or, or see what I've done for them, you know, because a lot of dancers don't create wealth, right? Like dance is not, Dance is not something that you're going to have a 401k with. You know all the I mean? snaps, Alyssa, all the yeah. snaps for you. <laughs> there's no 401k. There's no, you know. No insurance. No life insurance. No regular insurance, you know, like. No medical plan. Like, nothing, unless you nothing. go out, unless it's provided by the government. And I think you hit on, like, a really good subject, which is what yeah. I was kind of trying to tie in before, yeah. that dancers don't incorporate. They, not even themselves, right? They don't think about themselves as a dancer, as a business enough yeah. to incorporate themselves. That way, all the income, like, it's, you're you're able to deduct all these expenses that yeah. you're essentially paying for, like your costumes. Yeah. Like people all these know, other. It's just people don't know enough. And the problem is that because they don't know enough, they almost feel like they can't ask these questions or maybe they feel like, Oh, I'm just dumb. So I'm not going to ask these questions because I would feel dumb because I don't know the answer. But you have to ask because we don't have, we don't have any, um, anything to fall back on unless we do it ourselves as dancers, you know? Yeah. Um, but before, like, I just got this, this <laughs> plethora of snaps for you because I love talking about like what wealth looks like, yes. not just in dance, but just in the entrepreneurship realm, because mm-hmm. my mother, she was a business owner, uh, entrepreneur. I mean, she went on the route of the most stereotypical or not the typical uh, Dominican route. Uh, we lived in New York City, so she owned a plethora of bodegas. Mm-hmm. Um but there's no 401k in that. So it now for me, it's having that conversation with my mom. It's just like, you can't necessarily rely on social security. We have to see how we can invest the money that you're, you're gain, you're, that's, in, that's coming in and see if we can build wealth in other types yeah. of ways. Um, but I wanted to touch on your children and your husband because they're such a big part of your life. Oh, yeah. Um, and what is that? What is those two parts of your life, your children and your husband? Uh, look, intertwine with dance. Do they like yeah. to dance? Do they, they're just not about it. They're like, yeah. mom, leave me alone with that <laughs> salsa. Um, it's, it's interesting because I always feel like there's dance and then there's my family, right? And they're both equally as big, like these big portions of the pie. But they do intertwine because my kids do love to like dance and sing. Like my sing- my daughter's going to be a singer and a musician of some sort or something. You know what I mean? Like she's always trying to pick up an instrument. She's always, try- she's always singing. My son as well. My oldest, he's always singing. He's always acting. Um, he dances, but you know, it's like break dancing, but not really good break dancing. And then my youngest is, he tries to do like the river dance. He's always moving his feet, like happy feet. I'm like, okay, you got a little rhythm. So maybe samba. Maybe he's, yeah, he, he, doesn't, never he, know. he doesn't know he never yet. Know. <laughs> he doesn't know. I don't push him in any way, shape, or form to like a certain route. I mean, we play a lot of salsa music and I'm always like picking them up and dancing merengue and stuff like that just to keep, keep them moving. And, um, but my husband never danced growing up and, and he's Cuban. And they just didn't dance for religious reasons. They just, it's not something they did. So when I met him, he didn't dance. But where we connected is because um, he's a hip hop head and I was a hip hop head. My older brother, who's 10 years older, I'm super close to him. He was like shoving hip hop down my throat. (laughs) Like my first concert was not with my brother. So it was like, he was always teaching me like and having me listen and he would make me write rhymes like my brother. He used to, he used to rap in Spanish and he would make, and I didn't know that many words in Spanish. So I would just rap in English. So when I met my husband, 
my husband is a hip hop head and he also writes rhymes and he was just, so we hit it off on that, on that um, tip as far as, so he didn't dance, but he had a groove of like English music and the, and the type of music that I listened to. So, um, so we hit it off in that sense, but my family is, when it comes to Latin vintage, I think through the years, especially my husband, like I said, we were in Richmond and we were newlyweds. So even though the business was like mine, it also became part of him because now he was learning and all of our friends were through the business and people we've met and students and DJs and stuff. So now it was like, even though legally, you know, my name was the only one on the paper, it was ours, you know, it was always ours. Like he helped me. That's how he got into uh, video editing and stuff like that. You know, he was like, I need someone to do it and I can't do it. And you're better at the computer than me. So we're, learn something, you know, <laughs> help me. So it, it became a family thing. You know, the kids aren't like super involved with it, but now, especially with Corona, I do my classes like all the way downstairs and they'll come down they'll just sit and watch or they'll watch me or they'll ask questions or they'll hold my phone, you know, so I can, so they can record me. So they're involved in that sense. And they, um, and of course, all my, I try to get everyone who comes through Latin Vintage to meet my family because it isn't, because they are an extension of me. So I try to intertwine them in that way to always include them in everything that is Latin Vintage. But I was having this conversation the other day with one of my friends because coronavirus has shifted how we look at our businesses, right? How we, how we implement our businesses because I'm a, I'm a people person. I'm an interactive, like face-to-face. So having everything online is, is cool, but it also drains me from the joy that I normally would have. So it's been a, a different shift. So it feels like the, the, the two balls that were family Latin vintage, my family ball, because I'm always home with them now, has gotten so much bigger, right? Because I can't really do much for Latin vintage. So I've come to the point where I was like, oh, okay, um, it's become super more important. So now I'm thinking, okay, how do I still intertwine them? without the physical interaction in Latin vintage. So that's what I'm trying to figure out right now is, is how to keep them intertwined when they're not physically visible. But um, my husband has always been a huge part of Latin vintage. He's always, he's always supported, even though he never understood, you know, he's like, why are we spending all this money on this event? I'm like, because I love it, it's my passion. <laughs> you have to have a passion in life, you know? So. So he's like, all right, he's never really, he, I will say that's one of the things I appreciate about him mo most is that he always just supports. Even when I run away with an idea, he's like, in his mind, he's probably thinking this is going to take a lot of work, but go ahead. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's cool. As long as you support it. So, and my kids support it too. You know, I think it brings them joy to watch, to watch me. I will say that sometimes when I'm, when I'm not feeling good and I have to do a show or, or like, you know, the stresses of the world get you down. Like I, I have to have my kids there. Like I have to have my kids in the audience or I have to have my husband there watching or something, not doing, not do, not handling something tech. I need to have him right there so I can physically get the strength from them to keep doing what I'm doing. So I think they provide me, they provide me that strength and I'm always have them in my forefront of thought when I make decisions with the business. Like they, every decision I make has them in mind because everything I do with the business affects them. It affects our finances as a family. It affects our time together as a family. So it always goes back to um, thinking of them first and trying to spend as much time in keeping them in the, in the top, though having my passion. Um, so it's been, it's been a balancing act for a lot of years, but they always take precedence over the business, but it is one of those things that I don't think a lot of people think about in their, in their business is that how does the business affect my home life? And I'm always thinking about that. Like if I had another day because people want me to teach them, that takes away another day from my family. So how am I going to make up that time? Right. So I have to, yeah. I have to be able to make up that time and fill the cups of the ones that are going to be one day filling my own cup when I run out, you know? So, um, so yeah, I think they intertwine in that way that they have to simultaneously keep filling, you know, like Latin vintage fills me and then I fill them and then they fill me and I can fill Latin vintage more. So it's like this constant, um, 
array of, of just sending energy to different different parts for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you that because, which is awesome that you just touched on it when we were talking about your, what promote, what motivated you to open your business. You spoke on the joy, the joy that people would have with seeing you on stage. But again, like you just said, you can't give from an empty cup. So oh, yeah. I, was, I was like in the back, I'm like, well, I wonder what gives her like the strength to continue because we all do go through burnouts. There are points oh, in our yeah. lives where we're just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm just going to stay in bed. I don't want to, I just don't want to do it anymore. Um, but it's so beautiful that it's your family that, yeah. which came after technically sure. after your business. Mm-hmm. Um, well, except your husband, but yeah. that came after that. It gives you that strength and that motivation and that joy to keep giving others joy. Yeah. Yeah. Which, for sure. It's like a full circle. It is. It is a full yeah. circle. I think sometimes too, as I get older, my, my cup empties out quicker, right? <laughs> you're, like, you're like, goodness gracious, I need more stuff in my cup, you know, but it yeah. empties out a little quicker. So I have found, especially not so much when I, when I have burnout, like just in general in life, but when I have creative burnout, like I just, like you said, like sometimes you get up and you're like, I don't even want to go downstairs to teach this class, you know, like, yes, it's just like, why, why do I have to do this right now? You know, but once I'm there, I'm like in it, you know, like I just have to push myself to want to be there. And then once I'm there, it's fine. But I will say when I have like creative burnout, um, I start to listen to other forms of music because lately I've only been listening to songs I have to choreograph or songs I have to do something for someone else. But what I do is I go and take, I go back to my first form of dances and I take classes or I, I do movements in those other, like whether it's tap or whether it's jazz or hip hop or something. And it's that, it's the tech, learning the, the different technique in those other forms helps me to say, okay, now I can, I can, I've filled my cup in other forms of movement. So now my creative is going to be this, um, this free movement in my salsa. So sometimes when you're just doing salsa, salsa, salsa all the time, it gets very repetitive. So my cup, my creative cup dwindles. <laughs> but when I take other forms of dance or when I'm, or even, even if I'm home and I put on um, some Bob Marley and the kids are like jamming, you know, like they're doing something, just this having something else different than what I do on a normal basis fills up my cup in order to say, okay, I want to get up and, and teach that. Now I'm, I'm, I think of my salsa differently, or I think of my movement differently, even though I'm still going front and back, there's something that, that filled it with a different type of energy. So now I can give it even more energy, but my kids definitely fill my cup. Like some days I'll just be laying down and I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> and then my, not, my today. Son, not, not today, today. <laughs> not today, not today. And you know, my kids will have like a little meeting. Mom's not feeling good go get her something, you know, like, let's go. They'll be like, do you want a sugary snack? You know, like, that's they just amazing. Notice. They notice when you're down or when you, they have this like internal, like, are you cranky today? Like I used to be the, the joke that Wednesdays was my hardest day because I, I worked so long on Tuesdays that Wednesday I was like, oh my God, I can't do it. I can't do life on Wednesdays. So like, I remember one time my son was like, I mean, so tired, blah, blah, blah. She's, she's just so short. She, she's just yelling. And then my oldest was like, it's because it's Wednesday. We have to be nice to her on Wednesday. Oh my God. <laughs> like, they just knew. They just knew. They're like, this is the day that her cup is empty. We need to fill it today on a weekly so basis smart. every Wednesday. So, um, so, yeah, they definitely feel, they recognize when my cup is empty and they fill it. And then I rec- I'm starting to recognize when my cup is empty and then I fill it creatively because that's what helps me fill my cup is creative, creatively working, you know. That's so emotionally intelligent. Like that's like tapping into these, the subject that I feel not a lot of people understand or fully have a grasp on sometimes, especially like, like we said, like when we're talking about 25 year olds, they, yeah. they're just go, go, go. Like what is emotional intelligence? I am intelligent. I have a bachelor's. What are you talking about? Um, <laughs> yeah. So true. Yeah. I mean, so I was talking but to my not. friend. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't like, it's this, 
this time that we're living in has definitely questioned like what we use to validate ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, my and my friend were talking about like, here I am a bachelor educated uh, halfway through my master's, yet I have no idea why the significance of Juneteenth is so, so up there. Like that yeah. was never something that I learned, something that was never like pounded into my brain as a holiday. Yeah. So it just makes me question. I'm like, okay, yeah, you have a master's. That's great. You have a master's. That's great. But you don't. That you, paper doesn't validate your intelligence. No. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Uh, but I want, so on the subject of uh, emotional intelligence, I wanted to talk about, so you shared with me uh, how one of the important, uh, one of the important subject, subjects that to you is um, mental health mm -hmm. and uh, the effects of uh, PPD for moms. Yeah. So I kind of, depression. yes, postpartum depression. Sorry. I'm excuse me. Um, I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit about this, especially in this time where I feel like everyone is having a baby. Everyone is announcing that they're pregnant and they're expecting yeah. in October and December. Um, could you kind of little talk about perhaps not maybe your experience or like what you've learned through having three children, correct? Three yeah. children. Um, Back to back. back <laughs> I was back like to back. <laughs> pregnant for like four years. Yeah, let's like that. The the canal is open. Let's do this right now. Let's yeah, let's go. It, yeah. Was that it, intentional it, or just? Uh, no, not at all. Okay, <laughs> I'm just checking. <laughs> the first one was very much planned. The second one was, a, I think it was like my first Mother's Day, and I was like, oh my god, I want to be a mom. And I think God heard me too literally, and I was pregnant like when my first one was four months old or three months old i was already pregnant with my daughter so they're they're 11 months apart and then the second one is was the, or the third one came in i was like looking at the calendar like when was i ovulating like i don't even remember this time so he came in and i was just pregnant for like four years i always felt like i was pregnant <laughs> there was some students that were like i've never known you not to be pregnant like oh wow when i stopped having kids they were like i've never seen your body without a belly i'm like <laughs> That makes me feel great. Thanks. <laughs> like, but yeah, so I have three kids and um, I think why mental health has become so important to me is because being Latina and growing up in a Latina household, it's something that you never used to talk about, right? Like even emotional intelligence is not something that you used to talk about because emotions, what are those? You're not Just supposed get to over it. it. Stop Just, crying. Just, Just, Just get over stop it. Stop doing what you're doing and keep it moving. Like we raise our kids to be adults at six you know what i mean like they're supposed to handle all their emotions they're supposed to handle so it wasn't until later in life that i even learned that term emotional intelligence and i got really into like studying what that meant as as a young adult but when i had kids it was uh a lot of emotions hit me you know and i didn't recognize them at first you know like when my first born came out and then I was pregnant right away. And then when my daughter came out, it was just like, I just felt like this gloss, right? I was still going through all these motions, but I couldn't list them. And then when I would try to describe them to people, their answer was always, you know, like every, everything else when you grow up, just keep it moving. You know, like, what do you, what do you mean? Just don't think about that. Don't think like that. It's, it'll be fine. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't put any energy to that, it's, it's going to be okay. But that's not really, I'm not putting in any energy. It's just exists. <laughs> so I started to really think about what was making me feel that way. Um, and thinking about that, I have to put attention to that because it is something that could be detrimental to a lot of women in general, you know, having that, those feelings of, it's just, it's a chemical, like a hormonal imbalance, you know, you're creating this life. And then when they leave you, they're taking so much of you with you. Like when you think of it in that sense, you're like a part of you that you've had for nine months is now completely out of your system. And all your body is trying to react and, and you go through these things. And a lot, and obviously as a nation, we don't take very good care of ourselves, right? We don't take like, we just take a multivitamin and think that's enough. That's, that's not enough. The way you eat, the way you exercise the way you sleep all that affects your mental health um but then when you have a baby it adds to that need of everything else to be in alignment in order to make up for the fact that all this energy is now leaving you so um it took me a long time to realize that i i was going through ppd it took and not just realizing it but accepting it and saying it out loud right because there's always this like 
this blanket of shame that says, oh, you, you just can't handle it. So now you're depressed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like, no, it's not about not handling it. It's about, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm doing everything I can, but the way I was raised and the tools I got don't help me for this situation because it's, there's all these other avenues that I need to work at that I was never raised to even look at, you know, like you're just raised to just, this is the path. Don't look to your left and right. This is the, you know, don't feel this for this or don't feel that for that and keep going. So, but when you have a kid, you have to, you have to look at all these, these shades of grays and all these different emotions that you have in trying to figure out how to help your baby too, because they don't speak. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everything is a guessing game. So it was a lot of, a lot of learning, a lot of reading, a lot of self-care, a lot of looking within for a long time to figure out how to better myself in order to be a better parent. And it's not something that a lot of people talk about. So I'm really passionate about talking about it a lot more because I felt like I spent so long not talking about it that I could have helped someone else if I would have just said it from the beginning or someone else could have helped me if they would have acknowledged it. So now it's like super important to me to talk about just mental health in general without saying, without saying that it's wrong or saying that you're sick or saying, you know, like all the things that we grow up thinking about people that weren't always happy every day of the week, you know? <clears throat> yeah, so, no, especially like in, in the Latin dancing, I don't think that's, that's something that's really discussed. Um, oh, not at all. It's, so it's just, it's just about your body. It's like your physical abilities, but nothing to do with your emotional, what's your intention? Like, what's your mental capacity to do these things to connect, right? Because sometimes um, we talk about like, feel the music, like feel this and feel that, but okay, okay but like, are you applying the same intention of feeling to all the other aspects in your life? Yeah. Are you are you understanding what it takes to be a better human? Yes. Um, and with that, I kind of want to transition to where you are now and what where Lantern Vintage is. And uh, so we all know what's currently going on in the world, high empl- unemployment rate, global pandemic, uh, currently the social uprisings through the back- Black Lives Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. So one is, yeah, I don't know the, the closings in Virginia or how that it's, is we everything just, closed? Uh, currently, we just entered phase three. Are you stopping it? Oh. Currently, we just entered uh, phase three on Wednesday. So now there's, I think, like parks are open now. Like the, I mean, parks were open, but just like fields, not actual like playgrounds and things like that. So those are open now. It just started this week. Um, There are different counties that are taking more precautions than others. So like we live in Northern Virginia and they're a little more late to the game than everyone else, because I think they're like, we're not ready. We're not ready. My County, but as a state where we just entered phase three, which I think is, is, it's going okay. Um, But I think, um, before that, there wasn't very much opening. Like, I didn't even realize when we were in phase two because it felt like everything was still really closed. Um, the food places are, were always um, closed, but now they're open to, like, to like outdoor seating and stuff like that. But the, the places that I feel stayed open the most were, like, places like, like Home Depot and grocery stores, right? Those were the ones that were, like, Target, anything that sold food was open. And if those were your places, like I felt like the, the city would always just hang out there. Like, why are we all at Home Depot right now? Like, get your <laughs> stuff and go. Like, people would just chill out at Home Depot. Like, you could tell people aren't used to being home, you know? Yeah. But um, I think most people in, in where I live have, have respected that, you know, it is something that's serious, that we need to try and stay home as much as possible. But then, you know, I think people are are just not used to being with themselves for so long. So they just keep going out and going out, you know what I mean? And and it goes back to mental mental health, you know? If you can't be with yourself, (laughs) then what makes you think anyone else wants to be with you? Or your partner. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, People are breaking up, just like. Just People like, are like itching for the, divorce, for the 
courts to open up to file those divorce petitions and all these things. I know, it's I know. Yeah, it's insane. What happened? Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I think, but I think as a county, we've been doing good. Like in, in my county, we've, most people have been staying separate and you see a lot of people in masks and stuff. But I had to go to Florida um, last week or two weeks ago. And it was like, they had no idea that the coronavirus existed. And I'm like, I'm the only one with a mask and like, everybody's everywhere. I'm like, why, what, what is going on? And people didn't even say excuse. They're like this close to you, even though the circles are on the floor. So like the, like the companies or the businesses that are open are trying to get people to do anything, but the people are just like, Oh, <laughs> so I was like this all, all week in Florida. I'm like trying to create like a bubble around myself because there are some people that just don't, they're just not, <laughs> they're not with it. You know what I mean? No, they, they don't think it's going to impact them. Yeah. Uh, what is your uh, what is your vision or what is your plan or how do you plan on I guess um, continuing the business with the COVID. yeah how do you how do you see yourself starting the reopening process yeah for yourself it's it's been hard because for instance I rent I rent studio space I don't have my own studio space hold on one second no, it's okay. I need a pause. What did you say? Yeah, we can pause if he, uh, he needs to change batteries. He needs to change, I think, a memory card. Yeah. Is that what you said, babe? Yeah, he needs to, like, change a memory card. It's okay, Orlando. You're a part of this, 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 uh, this recording. Like, we're all a unit You're a part in the, <laughs> the recording. You're a part of the team. Oh, be quiet. He said I had all my dance videos taking up memory. No, you have like a gazillion other videos on there that you never erase from your camera. Julissa is the creative, the creative person. She can't take responsibility for the technical aspects. Sorry. That's what I mean. Saying. <laughs> but don't you get like, don't you get upset when, when they're like, well, something's not working. And I'm like, but why? Like, I did my half. Where's your, <laughs> I mean, that's, I, cause uh, with the starting this pod, this part, this podcast, like video series, Mm -hmm. um i it, it was so nice for what you were saying about orlando how like it's a team it's just i was just like i have no idea how to make a podcast i just want to have conversations with dancers and like have them I, I think sometimes we focus on talent and skill which is amazing like they're definitely but i always look at a dancer and i'm like well what do they think like what are what is the content inside of their brains yeah. that that can that will allow me to connect on an even deeper level or a higher yeah. level with these people that i admire yeah so he's just like, let's do it. Yeah, I got it. Okay, I'll just, I'll take care of all the technical things. And you just sit there and you just look pretty and talk. God, I wish. Yeah. See, Orlando's not there yet. Uh, yeah. You see Orlando? Like, I've been you... asking him for, for a podcast. I'm like, babe, I want to do this because I want to do a podcast about postpartum. Yeah. Postpartum depression and like speaking to, in, that, in that sense. So I'm like, I'm, I'm looking up all this stuff and I'm like, all right, I took all these notes. Can you help me? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, but you would know more than me. I don't even know what this line means. So it's like both of us learning, you know, but, but you know what it is too, is like, we have to, I, I've always, because I've always had Orlando, it's always been like, if I can't do something, I give it to him. Right. And I'm like, can you do this? Can you do this? But it's come to the point where I was like, no, what the hell, Jalissa? Just, just learn it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, just learn it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Especially with our three kids, like we can't both be busy doing something. Yeah. So you need to be, you need to be <laughs> doing something. So I've had to get out of my own way and be like, you just have to learn it. Like, don't be scared of learning something on the computer, which I've always been like, you know, my parents are, are older than most people's parents. So I'm like super old school when it comes to technology. Like, I'm like, I don't know what, how do I press start? You know, like, yeah, but it's Where's really the just record button. Yeah. It's really just me, you know, mentally I'm like, I can't do it. So then I don't do it. So, but yeah, so we're good on memory now. So the, the question was how um, <clears throat> am I going to be able to reopen like what is your yeah what is your plan on when reopening is able to happen in in Virginia well you're part of Virginia yeah so currently we are technically able to reopen but I rent space from uh, a dance company Ferocity Ferocity oh yay yeah I love cat Naps of Ferocity I love cat um, so I rent space from them so she uh, is starting to reopen very slowly because you know precautions and and people in in the I don't know why, but dancers don't know how to not dance. Like they have to be around people and dance and holding hands. It's just, 
it's beyond me. Like, yeah. like just chill out. Dance is always going to be there. Trust me. Yeah. I know. I've been dancing You can for a do long shines. Time. We can do shines for a long time. Yeah. And then <laughs> like, just like wait it out. Time. Yeah. But um, so she's taking the process really slow. She just started this month and like doing private lessons and taking her company back. Um, so she's not open for like outside companies to come in yet. She wants to make sure that everything's safe with her company before some flare up happens again. So I'm, I'm in waiting for that sense, but I still have, so like, I still have my dance companies, uh, my company and my, I have a ladies team. I actually stopped with my training team because it was just, it's hard when you have, um, like a student team because you really have to be there physically to really get training stuff. Um, so I've been doing most of those rehearsals on zoom, you know, weekly and it's, it's okay, you know, but obviously there's. I have to watch more videos now. So like each one has to send me a feedback video. So there's just more energy and watching all these videos and giving like written feedback and trying to make them look. So I think what I'm going to do is try to pick a day in a field where everyone can spread out because it's just impossible. But as far as public classes, um, I haven't really been, I haven't really had any hurry to do them. You know, like I feel like everyone's doing classes and, I've done my movement Mondays, which is literally just a footwork. And people are like, are you going to break this down? Are you going to teach this? No, you can, you're home, learn it, <laughs> watch the video over and over. <laughs> like that's how I used to learn stuff. I would just click on a video and try to like learn it just from watching them do it. So I haven't really had the motivation or the urgency to say, let's go back to public classes. Yeah. Because I just feel like this time is purposeful for me for my rest, for my regrouping, for, for connecting to the people that are already part of my organization in a way that I wasn't able to connect before because everything is like, we have this show, we have this thing, we're getting ready for this. And now it feels more like intentional to form relationships with the people that are part of your organization. So now I have, I'm more focused on not only dancing with the, my current people, but also forming more relationships during this time so that when we come back together, the language of movement is more eye to eye. Does that make sense? So sometimes yeah. as a teacher, you're just like, these are the steps, these are the steps, these are the steps, but you don't know, you're not emotionally attached to some of these people because a lot of people don't stay with you for a long time. You know, they come and they go and they go another team or whatever, but the people that are here now have been with me for a while. And it's just about, I'm just mainly focused on the business level to just form those relationships and, and focus on myself mentally and, and health wise so that I can come back and really have a clear path of what I want to do growth wise. But I'm not as a person, I, I can't, because I am so connected to people and, and in person that I, I can't get in with this, like, this virtual thing all the time. Like I've done, I've done an intensive where I make recordings and send people and stuff like that. And I can continue doing that, but I'm not in any hurry. I think a lot of people are in a hurry because they haven't, they haven't built their wealth to the point where they just have to keep, you know, they, they can take a break. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm not so, I'm not so, um, I'm not hanging on by a string because it's not doing, you know, reality is that out of the hundred percent of my business, I'm probably making 25% of that income that I used to be making, which isn't a lot anyways, because dancers don't make a lot, but now it's really a little, but I'm not dependent on that wealth because I've built the company to, to be my passion, not my sustenance. You know what I mean? Like yeah. a lot of people is like, this is my only avenue. This is my only income. This is my, you know, so I've built it to the point where I can take a break and it's not like broken and I have to rebuild and I feel like so many people are hustling to like keep this notion going and let me do this and let me do that and now you know like it's just I, I don't want to feel like that I don't want to feel like I don't want to feel like I'm rushing to do something for the sake of doing it because then it takes my joy and then it's not and then I don't want to do it at all so I have to uh, I have to pace myself honestly and I, I don't know what the opening is going to look like because I feel like the state of the world with all the gatherings and all the protests and stuff is where we need to be as a, as a country. So I'm not in a rush to be like, everybody get in so we can stop the Corona so we can go back to dancing. Like, no, we need to focus on what the nation needs to work on first. Yeah. 
And then, you know, if there's a spike and we have to be locked down again, I'm okay with that. Like that's, if that's what needs to happen for the world to be, to spin a little better then I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm not in any rush to be like, I have to have Latin vintage. I have to have Latin vintage. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just not in a rush. I feel like the things that are happening right now in the world are, we're needed. We're needed for everything. You know what I mean? Like my, I made a statement the other day and it was like, oh, cause we had a, cause we had to cancel another family vacation. And I'm like, oh Lord, I need the beach. I'm like, Corona is ruining everything. And my oldest was like, it's not ruining. It's because um, all the animals and the air, they needed, you know, they needed space and clean air. So God brought the coronavirus so that everyone would stop using their cars because the cars give all these pollutions. And I'm just looking at him like, oh, Lord, I need a cup, another <laughs> cup of coffee to get on your level. How did you come up with that? And I'm like, you're right. You know, like this time of rest is so needed more than more than we could have thought of. And the fact there are so many people like depressed and super anxious and just lets me know like yeah we we didn't have the mental health conversation before this happened so now we're here you know like so I'm not in a huge hurry to reopen there are some plans but it's not anything like significant to like get it back to 100 percent you know it's really just for I as a person need to keep moving and because that's what moves me and my and my everyday life like I can't just stop dancing but it's not in a hurry where I feel like I have to make an income because I need it in that way. Like I need dance because my body needs to move and to find another emotional avenue to release whatever's inside of me. But it's not because I need it the way I feel other people need it. Like, yeah, <clears throat> I think you I, touched, you touched on a, <clears throat> on a really beautiful thing because I feel like sometimes dancers, especially that are not making money off of dance, they're just going to dance as a, as a distraction, as a, as a way to not, to not, to get away from their day-to-day job, to all these other things. And they don't really look at dance as a release. Like you're saying, like some of other dancers who are just trying to release their like creativity and emotions, Uh, (coughs) really aligning yourself, right. With taking this time and taking this break to um, build up a three to six month emergency fund. Yeah. So that you Which don't is really hard to do so even pressure. when you have a regular job, you know? Yeah. Like, <clears throat> yeah. But um it's 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 really important when you're actually being a dancer. Like you you just have to think about that. And and obviously in the last like maybe year or two, I've really been thinking a lot about the term generational wealth, you know, like because you think about what you're leaving behind for your kids, like what you know, like will they be able to afford life because no one ever teaches about um financial stability until you're already jacked up you know what i mean like you're already you like you have to learn like it. 25 and you have four credit cards that are maxed out and then you're student like oh my loans. god i didn't realize oh student loans are the worst so like i especially in the last few years i'm like i can't i can't i can't give this you know this uh i feel like not creating that generational wealth, not that I'm going to make my kids rich, but just the understanding that you have to keep um, saving and, and doing things in the right direction to invest in the future, not just of you, but your previous of, for my grandchildren. You know what I mean? Like this, this thought that you're just not you doing it for you. You're doing it for your children's children's children because the world is always going to have student loans and hopefully not, but you know, the world is always going to have these things that that you have to spend money on that aren't need, that aren't needs they're wants and yeah. the human wants more than it can afford so you have to you have to prepare for that you know and and teach that to your children and the only way to teach that is to to do it yourself you know that's so beautiful and yeah. that's such a great way to i guess end our our little episode on uh i want to thank julissa for being such a a a plethora of resource to this community <laughs> and light. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, and I'm just going to include all the information where people can follow you and yeah. just keep up the tabs on all your social media platforms. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for this conversation, <laughs> Julissa. Yeah, of course. It was, it was fun. I'm glad. I can't wait to hear it. And I hope, uh, I can't wait to hear all your episodes. Is the, is the thing going to be called Cafe Con Jen? 
Yeah. So what we, so what we're going to, what I, I wanted to do is kind of, well, you, I don't know if you read a little bit about it. It's just like, again, this mentality of like, we look up to all these people. And again, with recent things, we look up to all these people and we're just like, oh, they're amazing. And like, they're such dynamic superstars, but we don't really know these people. Yeah. That's where I'm at, especially like also like major celebrities that are here out here. I think, yeah, like uh, I was reading on like Kim Kardashian and how you people look up to her. But I'm just like, she's 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 selling people unattainable body image goals. Mm -hmm. And um, and I for me, it's like you always hear her talk about makeup, but you don't really hear her talk about like what does she feel about body image like is she coming from a place of where she doesn't of unworthiness and that's why she's trying to appropriate these goals or is it is that she's coming from a place where she's just trying to make money and she doesn't care what people you know like yeah. it's just a, trying to understand the individual yeah, where they're coming from intention is it yeah. is important Sure. And if they're open to growth, because I think yeah. that changes the dynamics. If they're, if you're having a conversation with someone and then something sparks in them and you're like, you know what, you're right. Like, let me unpack this. Let me relearn mm -hmm. and let me become a better person. Yeah. Um, like with a lot of things that have been going on, I just feel like, especially in other realms, it's just, it, we're so easy to write someone off. Um, oh, yeah. cancel culture. Yeah. Like there's this guy that's like, has a shop in Washington Heights that I'm just like, um, he's sending out emails about his shop and selling products. But I'm like, bro, like, can you address the fact that all these, all these women from the Washington Heights have accused of you of misogyny, of anti-blackness, oh, of all these yeah. things. And I'm just like, okay, like, are you open to education? Are you open to how those comments were wrong? Are you open yeah. to like, yeah. So that, that's where I'm coming from. People, people call it ignorance, but it's not ignorance. You know, people enjoy it. People enjoy the term. People that are, 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 are not addressing those things just enjoy the um, staying stuck in that ignorance. They, they're comfortable. They yeah. enjoy comfortability. So, but that's, that's, you know, that's the world we live in. I feel like everyone does everything because of comfort, you know, and not everything is supposed to be comfortable. You don't grow in comfort, you know? Yeah, like in dance, like in your personality, like everything. Yeah, for sure. Julissa, thank you so much. I don't want I know I know we're going over time. <laughs> and you, I, I'm just so over much. here. I'm like, I can talk to her forever, but I, I, <laughs> I wanna be so respectful of your time because I know your your schedule and I just I just want to oh, be no, you're fine, so don't, girl. don't you're think give, that I'm like trying to cut you off. You're giving me a break. So I'm okay. like, okay, the door is locked, you give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Julissa. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Oh, that was awesome. I hope you learned something. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, or just send us a message on any of our social media platforms to see what's next, to tell us what you want to see next. And uh, thank you so much for your support. Peace out. Mm -hmm.